in there as well. So I know that with uh, our fashion and culture, we tend to recreate the 80s, but I've never seen the stubbies come back yet, thankfully. <laughs> so um, it was before the internet, as we know, before a different kind of communication. Um, it was before reality TV, and it was when you could make mistakes and not the world didn't really know about it. Like you didn't get on Facebook, it wasn't liked, it wasn't shared, and so you could really keep some of those. Oh, small town, big, yeah. Well, I come from the Gold Coast, so it was a little bigger, but uh, yes, doesn't, it spins a lot quicker. And one of my favourite songs at the time uh, on my hit list was Bohemian Rhapsody. And it was, um, I know that sort of came out in the 70s, but it still sort of hung around. And I think it had a real revitalisation with uh, Wayne's World. And that's the one I really remember. I think that came out in 92 um, with Wayne's World, Guys in the Car. And, uh, and I won't sing it. I'll just say the first few lines. It says, is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? Caught in a landslide, no escape from reality. So um, in the 80s is when I really started my landslide. Well, actually, it was a bit of a, a roller coaster in some respects. So. It was fame, fortune, heartache, loss, and really some extreme challenges that went my way. Up to 19, I, think I had a wonderful nomadic life. I would get a job just so I could pay for my next adventure. Okay? I was free, I was independent, no ties, I was having a good life. I was travelling overseas, travelling up and down the coast, and just being the real beach bum that I thought I could be all my life. Making no real choices, no ties. Thing was, it came unstuck in my 20s. And it really tested my resolve when I had no place to live, no income, and a partner who was told he had six months to live, and three lilies that looked to me for their comfort and security. So it was a real switch for me. So obviously some lessons to be learned for me. Look, it was way back. It, it wasn't at a lifetime, but it did, did show, shake my thinking to know that whatever comes your way, you do not accept anything but the best for your life. At that time I didn't. Now I know you do. You accept only the best for your life. I also learned that if you don't know where you're going, then any road will do. So what I was doing was stockpiling all these bad choices in my life. It was one after another after another. I just couldn't, you know, catch a break really. It was getting harder and harder. I chose someone to come into my life and I really didn't think it through. Um, I didn't know if it was actually best for me. I just went with it and it really started that roller coaster ride. He was a gambler. So you can imagine he brought fame and fortune sometimes and desperation other times. If you've known any gamblers, sometimes the fridge is full and you're having a banquet and other times you're really scratching around to see if you've got any milk left in the bottom of the carton because that's all you've got. So it was a very much a roller coaster ride. Um, his health was failing. He contracted cardiomyopathy, which is an enlargement of the heart and he was chronically ill for six years. Um, so by the time I was 23, I was caring for an invalid husband, three children, and no permanent home, nothing. When he um, collapsed in the emergency room of the PA hospital in Brisbane, and he spent six weeks in the intensive care unit, I also found out that he not paid the rent for six months. Um, <laughs> Wonderful, terrific, thank you. Um, so then I had no place to live. And look, that happened a few times, um, having no place to live. Um, thankfully, we weren't on the streets. I mean, there were refuges and there was family. But to have that feeling that you've got no home really does erode your self-worth and self-belief and um, can really bring you down that, well, nothing's going to work out for me. Um, so that wonderful nomadic life I had, mm, gone. It was a bit of a hit the, hit the brick wall situation. Um, 
Now, I'm sure most of you have had those signature moments in your life, moments where you vividly remember where you were, what happened, and it had an impact on you as to um, maybe changing your course, um, causing you to make a decision. Okay, those really signature moments. And um, one of the turning points or those signature moments that I have in my memory is that um, after six years of being in and out of hospital, um, my partner um, came home from a doctor's visit and said that he had six months to live. <coughs> he was told he had six months to live. The heart just wasn't working. You know, they, they, your heart goes like this. When it's got cardiomyopathy, it goes like that. His it started to turn into a little black. The surgeon told me this. Um, like this, it just wasn't working very well. So six months. So you can imagine I'm sitting there going, oh really? Um, I thought it was tough before. No, it's going to get a whole lot worse, Lisa. It's going to get worse. So look, you really find out what you're made of. Um, you really find out what's important, what your values are when you get to those, those kind of crisis moments. You find out what your character is. And you also have you handle situations. This is it. So for me, the second lesson was really about having a self-belief that I can get through this. Having, so from a person that was starting to erode that belief, it started to really think, well, hold on a minute. I've got to fight this. I've got to become some kind of warrior here and have some self-belief in what I can do. We only arrived in Toowoomba, actually, at that time, um, several months before. And I can say that I was surrounded by good people, and good people wanting to help and to support. And it's important that in your tough times and also in your good times that you have good people around you. People who are encouragers, people who are thoughtful, that are intuitive and wise. And, and really, <coughs> the, what you've got here in your back scratches shows to me that you're a community that wants to help each other. And that is a strength to have. And I found that when I um, first came to Toowoomba, um, uh, good people to support me. So this is where, have you heard those books, um, you know, where you can create your own ending? You have your own, you know, you can have a story and create your own ending. So I'm hoping now you sort of think, so how's this scenario turning out, Lisa? Okay. How would this be working out for you? Choose your own ending. So here I am, found out my partner's got six months to live. I've got three children, okay? They're only about this high. They're only about six and seven, around that height. Okay, you see me now, okay? I'm educated, I have qualifications, I have a home, I've started a business. But what do you think happened next after hearing he had six months? Any suggestions you'd like to put forward? Well, you obviously made a decision. Yes. As, as to that decision, what it was, I don't know. But you no, obviously, I obviously decided to make a ch an, an, an adjustment in your thinking. Yeah. You decided, I don't know, you decided that you were going to take the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you'd sort of think he'd be dead, wouldn't you? No, I was going to say. He'd yeah. Be dead. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've got another husband, so where is he? That one, he'd sort of be dead, wouldn't he? Something happened, or well, that was only a suggestion by the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, six months old. <clears throat> well, okay, those kind of scenarios I, I, I thought would, would come through for me too, but um, what happened next was actually something I, I could never have dreamed of at the time. So within three months, he had a heart transplant. Uh, we had that at uh, St. Vincent's after a few. Um, trial and errors, going back and forth, wrong heart, a whole different situations. It's about the era of um, Dr. Victor Chang. Have you heard of Victor Chang? He actually was um, murdered the year after. And um, he, uh, so the unit was still fairly new. I think um, he was number 98 in the transplants and the only ones that um, survived at the time uh, were Fiona Coot. Uh, heard of Fiona? Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, David, um, my ex, uh, 
Cup was um, about the only survivors. So he was number 98. So there was a lot of ones that didn't make it through. Um, what I found in that sort of situation, um, meeting these people and being in that hospital environment, it was actually um, not only physically to be right, but mentally. So it was about the hope, about that they had a future. Um, when we met certain people that did not, um, uh, were very negative about their transplant, oh, this isn't going to work, I don't know if I'm going to live, well, yeah. That's right, they didn't. And those that um, had a very positive outlook, were hopeful, were charging into their future, did well, really did well. You, so we had a heart saw, transplant. You, you actually physically saw this yourself, is that what you're yes. saying? Yeah. Yes, yes. Stand there for three months. You, once you have the op, um, you go to um, into these units, because you have to go back and forth every day to the um, aftercare and that. And you talk about moments, and you know that your memories are, are funny things where you actually go, your memory is so strong you actually go back to certain places and that. Um, <laughs> during the opera, uh, operation, we, um, I was up in the waiting room and I could hear an ambulance siren. And I'm looking out, out the window and along comes the ambulance now. Who takes an esky, little esky, to work for lunch? <coughs> so when I see an esky now, <laughs> those little ones, just a bit, that one, up comes the ambulance the, the, and the police. It's got a police escort and everything, so there's a lot of kerfuffle going on. Um, that's where the heart was in the esky <coughs> to be transplanted. He started running. He became um, an athlete, okay? He spent a lot of time down the Australian Institute of um, uh, Sport. He um, travelled overseas with his running. He competed in games and, um, and did very well. And he was of reasonable good health. He was um, immunosuppressed, um, which can be its drawbacks uh, with that, but generally living a great life um, in this new role as an athlete, something he'd never tried before. So, um, <coughs> but within three years, he disappeared out of my life. He walked out one day and never came back. Gone. Not only did that, he left me with a lot of debt. <laughs> a lot of debt and the three children to take care of. So by this time now, they're, you know, just at um, uh, middle primary. Expensive stage. Yes, yeah, you're going to high school and you've got to get the right uniforms and the books and, <clears throat> and sport and music and, and everything else that I wanted in their lives. And uh, yeah, a lot of debt. Um, so I had to really work my way through that. Uh, it's another story, really, in some respects, as to um, it was Easter, he said he had to go to Sydney. And then he never came back. So, never seen him again. Never saw him again. So, was that your scenario? Certainly wasn't mine. <laughs> but one of the pure motivating factors for me was that I was always to be a role model to my children. And um, look, they have their own lives now. They're all grown up. But it is actually still a determining factor for me uh, that my goals are still a role model to my children. They still ask me what, I'm, you know, what my goals are and what am I doing. And, and they still sort of look to see what I'm doing um, to see how they're tracking. So it was a, one huge motivating factor for me to make sure that I, my goals, my choices, were, were going to do well for them. Um, look, we think on average about, what, 60,000 thoughts every day. And 90% of those thoughts that we have are actually in our past. Of what we've done, how we've done it, you know, how we think, how we act, all those thoughts, how we feel, are based on what has happened to us in our past. And it's those thoughts that actually have shaped your belief, haven't they, about yourself and also about others. So for me, the shift came when I actually started to believe in myself. 
And instead of, oh look, any road will do, as I did when I was younger, I now had a responsibility and I had a vision to be the person I wanted my children to respect. So it was a very strong um, focus for me. Again, my qualifications, that's why one of the exams was in here. Um, I found my niche in organisational development and uh, found that, wow, this is a great way to help other people develop their talents. And I haven't looked back since. So the next step actually came to me quite naturally is to start my coach and training services. And so now my vision is to put myself out there and with one burning aim, and that is to help others succeed. If I can do it, everyone. Look, we have tremendous talents and you can succeed against the odds. I know this. And you can persist in the face of doubt. I know this. And you possess true determination to never quit until the goal is reached. So it's not any road will do for me. And I choose how to conduct myself and believe in myself and know it is possible. Um, one of the things I do when I was talking to Steve about, he says, oh, please mention this, and I'm, I'm glad he asked me to do that, is that I'm involved with City Women Toowoomba. And I was drawn to them because of their vision and it was to make our city a better place for women and girls. So I've just started out with them, I've drawn uh, with them actually after here, I, I'll go to them. Um, and what we do there is they have two pro programs, one just fresh. Uh, the first one is Bella Girls in School and it's a, a program, eight to ten week course, about two hours every week uh, for the young ladies. And it's really focusing on uh, their self-esteem, their value, their worth, uh, <coughs> building their confidence, their value, their, their purpose. Okay? And that's what it's about. And they're also starting a program for middle primary as well, called Girl Wise Programs. So I am um, very excited actually about being involved in a group that wants to advance young women um, in the community. Um, so I'll just leave, I, there's a quote that I, I always got to have because um, it has such a profound effect on me. And it was Helen Keller. Helen Keller was a, an author in the 1920s, so she couldn't see. She couldn't speak. She couldn't hear. Three major disabilities that became, you know, a well-known author. And her quote is that what's worse than a person who is blind is a person who can see but has no vision. And that really hit me because here I am thinking, look, she can't see, she can't speak, she can't hear, she can't, you know, all the things that we think, but she, what she sees is a worse disability is when you don't have a vision. You don't have something set out for your life or what you want to attain, what you want to do, what you want to have to make the best of your life. I'll, I'll just leave with that with, with you. Know that I've survived. I've done more than survive. I've thrived. Um, I don't know where he is. He could be dead now. I'm not sure. But I have my own back scratcher now. Uh, that's my, um, my husband, Gary, who is totally supportive and has always got my back. And I uh, appreciate him and love him for that. So I thank you for your time. Thanks, Steve. Don't go and, anywhere. Uh, we have questions to ask. Oh, I feel okay. Sure. <laughs> Cool. Who's going to I've be first? Questions. <laughs> oh, you stunned us into silence. That's good. That's good. <laughs> there we go. Yes. Do you believe when I do that um, lock and self-fulfilling prophecies? Often, what you say is, you know, be careful what you wish for. Very much. I mean, your thoughts become uh, your thoughts become your words, become your behaviours, become your actions. What you think. So, um, what you see is what you believe. And I think what Einstein said, what you see on the screen of your mind is a picture of the coming attractions. So if you believe um, that things won't work out, I um, had to go and speak at, um, just a few months ago, at uh, a large audience. And uh, you know, the first words that came out of my mouth were, oh my God, that's daunting. And I had to pick myself up on that. So picking up on your language and going, 
Did I really say that? That's daunting. No, it's not. This is going to be great. This is so you really need to change what your thinking is. Otherwise, I could have walked in there and gone, "Oh my God, it's daunting. My knees are shaking. I'm not going to be any good at this." And that could have been it. Yeah. So very much so. Okay, from me. Oh, Gary. No, you. Hi, Gary. My Gary's got two hours. Yeah. Oh, one hour. Thank you. Do you live over Wilsonton? Uh, Lillian Court, no, Harristown. Harristown, right? Yeah. Uh, my question to you is um, the ex partner that left. Yeah. Is it possibly he gave you the gift of not being a burden? Did he, so maybe he thought about he this? Yes, yes. Well, you know, I found him. I did find him. Oh, did you? Oh, oh yeah. See, <laughs> was he gambling? You reckon I just. No. Um, it was actually the, um, <coughs> the police found him. And uh, they gave me a call and gave me his phone number, and he was in Perth. And so I called him and was like, oh, you know, um, why don't you come over? Let's start a new life. Um, you know, come on over here. And I thought, God, you've just left me with this whole destruction, you know. I, um, I had you know, three children in three years, so they're all around the, the same age really and uh, I said look I found him oh, yes. and um, they loved him I mean great father um, I found him he's in Perth do you want to go no I said okay no okay. they were very clear that this was it we couldn't we couldn't live that life anymore it was too hard that's all we go like one door closes and another one up yeah you know what I mean like I found, and it's really um, amazing that uh, after being with a gambler, and, you know, he was alcoholic um, as well, but you wouldn't know it, like you wouldn't pick it, and um, no money. And then after leaving, even though I had debt, I had money to pay for it. It was like money was coming into my purse. I know it was, you know, because I was, I, I started working, but I was, I had, had control of the money. I was saving, I was doing, you know, and uh, now I, I had money to be able to, to manage that debt. I mean, yeah, you go to solicitors and you, you work it all out um, as to how your payment schedule is. But, um, had, so I actually started from nothing when, um, in my 30s, really, started from, from the basics. Um, and that is time. Thank you very much.